Welcome to Caregiver SOS On Air, presented by the WellMed Charitable Foundation, a program providing help and information for our caregivers who are vital to the health and welfare of so many people in our community. You can hear Caregiver SOS On Air Sundays at 6 p.m. on 9.30 a.m. The Answer. And now, here are your hosts, Ron Aaron and Carol Zernio. Well, thank you very much for joining us here on Caregiver SOS On Air. I'm Ron Aaron. You hear us at 9.30 a.m. The Answer, our program brought to you by the WellMed Charitable Foundation. With me today, Carol Zerniel on special assignment. Peaches Hall is pinch hitting. She's the executive director, the director of the Doris Griffin One Stop Senior Center over on 410 at the Ingram Park Mall. It's a lot of words in one it little is. sentence. A center that opened just six months ago with no members and now has over 3,000. Yeah. Doris, uh, Doris Griffin ought to be proud. She is. She was in about a week ago and just beaming. She just loves coming in. One amazing woman who founded and runs Jefferson Outreach, an organization on the west side that helps a lot, whole lot of seniors and their families. She does. She makes sure she keeps them in their homes as long as she possibly can. She's now, great. We're going to be talking in, in just a few minutes, Peaches Hall, uh, with Dr. Jill Crystal, who's a psychologist who deals with transitions, helping people through the changes that come in life, whether they be big or small, uh, changes involving families that split up and have to move to various parts of the country, uh, folks who have to relocate for jobs, and uh, people who are suddenly finding a change in their family because they've become caregivers. Mm -hmm. You see that in your work. I do. Um, th there's, it's very stressful being a caregiver, and then it's very stressful making the decision if you're going to place them in a memory care community. Um, not only is just the stress, but it's also the the guilt and the finances, it's very complex. And the unfortunate stereotypes about memory care mm -hmm. facilities, and you worked in uh, that field in Florida for many years. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the stereotypes, of course, is you walk in the door, they take you in the back room, and they shoot you up with drugs. They're going to knock you out for the next 10 years of your life if you live that long. Right, right. Um, and that's that possibly could be some places still. Uh, so I always say investigate, visit, visit, and visit. So you want to make sure you're comfortable with the care they're giving. You want to make sure you know everybody there from management to caregivers. Um, because the frontline people are the ones that are going to watch for you and are going to love your loved one. Your stepdad had Alzheimer's. He did. Talk to us about uh, what kind of transition that was in your life as the diagnosis came in and his uh, situation changed. Yeah, I thought I was a specialist until it happened to me. It was completely different. I, I went from that very strong person that knows, sits down and talks with families, to I had to back it up a little bit and punt. It, it's different when it's in your backyard. And my dad was a biter and a fighter. And um, it was difficult because I was doing it long distance. He was in California. And I remember getting a call from the executive director of the nursing home he was in and said, you need to come and get him right now. I was like, oh, my goodness, what's happened? And they said, well, he just bit somebody right on the breast, one of the nurses. And I said, well, what was she doing bending over him? And did he even have his teeth in? I mean, so she calmed down and everything. We just have to kind of work through it sometimes. Those are two questions that only an experienced <laughs> health care provider would think of asking. What was she doing bending over him? And second of all, did he have his teeth in? Yeah. Because so, he can't hurt her gumming her. No, no. And he didn't like to answer? wear them. Um, she kind of just mumbled through it, and she hadn't, uh, no answers. Yeah. <laughs> no answers. That was the deal. So she went back and looked at it. And sometimes they're stressed, too, because the staff is coming to him saying this man. And I don't doubt that he probably used some language, and he was aggressive and angry. But when somebody does come up to you too fast or gets in your face, or the, and they, you know, their perception and their vision has changed, it's very difficult. And a lot of times they don't think about that, especially in just a traditional nursing home because they're not trained for dementia care. My dad uh, developed dementia, and my folks were married 65 years. Mm. Uh, 60 or so were fabulous, and mm -hmm. then he began to go downhill. Mm -hmm. In the years they were married before dementia, mm -hmm. uh, I never saw them fight. I never saw him raise his voice. I never saw her raise her voice. Mm -hmm. Once he developed dementia, he did go through a very short period of time where he mm -hmm. became really angry. Mm -hmm. And I attributed it to him knowing what was happening to himself. I, I can only think that in many cases because there's nothing you can do and you can't communicate when your language gets to that word salad and people don't. And again, if you're somewhere they, they're not trained and they don't look at you and try to figure out and say, I understand and let's try to work through this, um, it, it, it can become 
huge stimulation to anger just keeps moving and moving and that agitation grows and grows and you, they don't have any outlet except for an outburst and one of the pieces of advice that Carol Zerniel, who is on special assignment today and not with us, well, when we bring this topic up, she often will say, remember, it's not personal. He's mm -hmm. not angry at you. Mm -hmm. He's become a different person. Right, right. And, and you know, if you're, if you're encapsulated and you can't use your language skills and you sometimes can't even point anymore and you certainly can't remember who that person is in front of you, I would be stressed too. So I would how, be stressed too. How did you communicate with folks who had such trouble communicating? You know, it, it all depends on, and that's the one thing that when somebody is going to a dementia unit and you're, you're really considering where you're going to, they should have a bio. Somebody should know the the siblings that that were in that person's life the what their work was what they what they did for joy if were they a painter were they for, now maybe they're not interested in doing that anymore but sometimes having those conversations with them can stimulate and bring back and calm them um, you know if you have somebody that's always saying we had a lady that just kept saying Ginny 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 well that was a sister named Virginia and if we hadn't known that we wouldn't have been able to say, Virginia's coming next weekend. She's coming to visit. She's coming. So if you don't know that person, then you don't know that person. And that's what's dangerous. That's what makes them frustrated. That's what makes them lash out. Now, trust me, sometimes they don't know Jenny either. But if you, the more you know, the better you are. And although some of the memory goes with mm -hmm. Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. not all. Not all. Yeah, it's funny. Sometimes they will say, I want to go home, and the wife will say, I'm just going to take him home just for, for the day. I, you know, I just feel so bad because he keeps saying he wants to go home. And they get him home, and they go, no, this isn't home. They're talking about going back to Alabama or somewhere. Where they, they were. Grew yes, up. yes. Childhood home. Yes, so it's real important to listen and to know what stage they're in and to understand and work through that with them. And for the family, for the caregiver, in just a moment, we're going to be talking with Dr. Jill Crystal about a lot of these issues, talking about transitions and changes that come in life. Uh, for the family who have suddenly become caregivers, mm -hmm. uh, it's a whole different ballgame. And most of us aren't trained to do that. No, and some of us are not meant to do that. It's a personality that enjoys that. It doesn't mean you love someone less or more or whatever. Some people are just not natural caregivers. So get help. Get support. Um, if your sister is a better caregiver than you are, then depend on that person to help you. And you don't have to feel guilty about it. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Now, in your stepfather's case, who was providing care before he went into a, a residential it facility? Was, it was my mom. And she and it just about crumbled her. She was exhausted. But a lot of times you see them going to memory care communities when the loved one who's caring for them is just about to buckle. Um, and it's it's sad because you wish they could have got them a, a little sooner because if they get in an environment a little sooner, sometimes they adjust better if their dementia hasn't gone as escalated as it has. But people have to make the decisions where they're comfortable. We don't have a magic bullet yet or, or any real treatment for mm. Alzheimer's. There's no prevention out there. Mm. We are getting better at diagnosing them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that important? You know, it is important because it's help for the, f helpful for the family to plan. And planning is a big part of this. Um, it, it's such an unpredictable disease, but you still can plan. And as you take a look at the cost involved, so many families uh, outlive their mm -hmm. financial resources. They do. And so I always tell, that's the one thing I'd always say, if somebody was bringing their, their father in or their mother in, as soon as we got everything taken care of, then I would say, do you have long-term care insurance? Please make sure that you do that. If you don't do anything else for yourself, do that. Depending on your age, though, it's unaffordable. Um, at times, and if you have medical issues, too. But you can still get it at 40 and 50 mm -hmm. and 60. And it's, you should. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For you, the, the psychic income, the reward that you got uh, working both in uh, a memory unit and now as director of the Doris Griffin Senior One Stop mm -hmm. Center, uh, w what is it that's coming back to Peaches? Um, I love them both. I really, I'm, I miss um, in my heart a lot of the dementia. I miss that because I loved working with the the dementia residents. Um, God, they were wonderful and loving and sometimes a pickle, <laughs> but I love that part. And the thing I like about working at the Doris Griffin Center is that they're commutative. They're, they, they work for the community. They work 
as volunteers and that they communicate to me. There's a full conversation. When you're talking with someone with dementia, it's you're hoping you're on the right track and you're kind of agreeing or, you know, talking about just you're one-sided. But this is a two-sided conversation when I'm talking with the seniors there. And I love to see the health change. When people come in and their sugar's through the roof and then within three months it's normal or their cholesterol is or they're lost weight, or they feel stronger, and they come to me, and I, I love it because some of them will go to exercise, and they go, now I'm supposed to get thinner, but my pants are tighter. And I go, well, that's because your butt's where it's at now. It's supposed to be. So, you know, <laughs> it, it makes a big difference. Your muscles are changing, and it's great. So I love that. I love every single bit of that part. I was there uh, a couple of weeks ago flying the wall, and I had the opportunity to see you in action. The place was jammed. <laughs> and you know everybody's name. Uh, yeah, some it's days, like cheers. some days my memory's sharper than others, <laughs> but I can always say, "I'm so glad to see you." <laughs> but uh, they are wonderful. Yeah, I, we try to really do that. It is a family. It's a big, ginormous, three thousand person family. And for folks uh, who are listening who I uh, didn't catch you on this show last week, uh, if you want to become a member at the Doris Griffin One Stop Senior Center mm-hmm. or the other WellMed mm-hmm. Chevrolet Foundation Senior Centers, how do you do that? You just have to be 60. You come in and fill out a short form. We want some information on you to keep you safe, keep us knowing who you are, and it is easy as pie. If you're 59, don't rush it. <laughs> <laughs> and the hours? We're open from 7 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon, Monday through Friday. And it is the cutest thing because we have to start giving five-minute calls. <laughs> you know, to get them out of there. Yeah, so we start you know, about 3.30. Just want to remind you. Well, see, there's like cheers. Yes, Last round. yes, yes, it is. A- and the folks arrive how early in the morning? At uh, a quarter to 7. Lined up? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Really? Yes. We start taking calls for our aerobic classes at 7.30, and by 7.40 to 7.45, they're full for the day. No kidding. Mm-hmm. That's yep. pretty cool. Yeah, it's just, it's fast and furious for about 15 minutes, and then the whole day is completely booked. And we have lots of classes and great instructors. We're going to talk to Dr. Jill Crystal in just a couple of moments uh, Psychologist who deals with people in transitions, Peaches Hall, pinch hitting for Carol Zerniel here on Caregiver SOS On Air. I'm Ron Aaron. You hear us at 9.30 a.m., The Answer. I'm Ron Aaron, and one of the things I'm most pleased about being a well-med patient is the way in which I'm treated by all the staff at the clinic I go to. And Dr. Robin Eikhoff, uh, that's not by accident. No, it's not. We really spend a lot of time training our staff and asking them to really connect with the patients and get to know them because we consider them part of our clinic home. And the other thing that's really impressive to me is the amount of time my WellMed physician spends with me. And you do the same thing with your patients. Yeah, I, I really do try to. And, and we do a lot, a lot more time than your typical uh, provider can afford to give. And I think that allows us to get to know the whole patient and not just their diseases. That's cool. Don't have a lot of time to talk about prevention, but you do a lot of that as well. We spend an enormous amount of time on preventative measures. Want information about WellMed? Want to be a WellMed patient? Call 210-614-WELL. 614-WELL. We're so pleased you're sticking with us on Caregiver SOS On Air. I'm Ron Aaron. We're delighted to have you with us in this conversation with Dr. Jill Crystal, an expert on transitions and moving and changes in life. And we're so pleased that she's joining us here on 930 AM, The Answer. Uh, Jill, nice talking with you. Nice talking with you. I'm glad to be here today. Well, we're delighted to have you. And as we talked briefly off the air, uh, you've got a great story. And we live in a world in San Antonio is a really good example where people are so widespread In the old days, as you know, families stayed together, lived together. Grandma moved in with her kids when she couldn't take care of herself, and they carried out those responsibilities uh, until her last days. Uh, But today it is all long distance, and you kind of stumbled onto this. How? Absolutely. We were living abroad in London for many years. We we being you you and your husband and kids. My husband, yes, my husband and myself and our kids. Kids were born there, and I started working as a psychologist and started working primarily with expatriates who were living in London and started recognizing a lot of the issues that you have to deal with, both personally and professionally. I myself had my parents um, living back in Arizona and my husband's parents living in Sweden, and 
started recognizing that there were just a lot of different issues that add complexity to everyday life. And then started um, moved back to the United States and uh, did some speaking for an organization called Families in Global Transition, where I worked with a colleague and we ended up creating a presentation for expats about dealing with elderly relatives when you live far away. And that was well received. And my colleague then found out about the Aging in America conference. And we submitted there and presented a poster session there this summer and just came to realize that this is an issue affecting not just people who live outside of the country where their elderly relatives are, but for anybody who's living in a different state or even in a different city. That's where you met our co-host, Carol Zerniel, at that conference. Mm -hmm. And she spoke very highly of you, which is uh, one of the great reasons you're with us. (laughs) I I went through that as well. I live in San Antonio. Uh, My mom and dad, now deceased, uh, living in Cleveland where I grew up. I've got a brother there who, like you, is a Ph.D. psychologist. Uh, And as they aged and became... Uh, less and less able to care for themselves. Uh, there was nothing I could do from here. Fortunately, uh, my brother Jim uh, took on that responsibility. And uh, I, I will tell you not to pat myself on the back, Dr. Crystal, but uh, to point out the one thing I learned very quickly is don't question what Jimmy was doing. Just be supportive. Exactly. And that in and of itself is something that you can be doing because I think the caretaker on on the ground needs a lot of support. They need somebody that they can vent to, and they need somebody that they can toss ideas around to. But I think it's incredibly important, also the lesson that you learn, that they're the ones there, and there is, for as much empathy and sympathy and understanding as we might try to have, when you're not the one dealing with the day-to-day, you really can't understand it fully. Well, here's how I learned that very quickly. I, I uh, at one point, and, and my mom passed away a few years ago, my dad more years ago than that, uh, but when he was taking care of both of them uh, and uh, really juggling in, in his life a lot of responsibilities, I, I simply one day asked a question, and I don't even remember what the question was, but his answer was perfect. You know, Ronnie, that's a great question. In fact, They'll be on a plane tomorrow. You can pick them up at San Antonio <laughs> International Airport, and you can handle all this. Mm-hmm. Perfect response. Absolutely, because it it you know it brings up another thing that can happen so often between siblings or you know anybody who's caretaking and 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 the other people who are far away is that there can be a lot of resentment from the people who are there on the ground and a lot of guilt from the people who aren't there on the ground. Um, And another interesting story that you reminded me of is kind of when the, you know, the siblings come home to visit, suddenly they are elevated in the parents' eyes very often and getting special attention and special appreciation for, oh, you made the effort to come and see me and you're so wonderful and that's so terrific, which really is demeaning, not intentionally so, but, you know, the person who's there on the ground every day, it's taken for granted a lot of times. It's the old and line, so, so what am I, chop liver? Exactly, exactly, exactly. Now, you have put together, and, and, and I have a copy of a really cool poster that you have done, and uh, you got a bunch of balls in the air. Nobody can juggle as many balls as you have, and, and yet this is a lot of what uh, uh, caregivers go through and what those in the distance go through. And you mentioned uh, guilt and resentment as two of those balls. And if you don't mind, by the way, if you've just joined us, you're listening to Caregiver SOS on air. I'm Ron Aaron. Carol Zerniel on special assignment today, and we're talking with Dr. Jill Crystal, clinical psychologist who is specialized in issues involving distance caregiving and siblings. Uh, Can we go through some of these uh, uh, balls that are being juggled one by one and, and begin perhaps... Uh, Jill, with absent family members, and what is it you mean by that? Well, that some of the people who are involved in caregiving or who are caring about their elderly loved ones are far away. And, you know, they may be in another city, they may be in another country, and, you know, or they may be working full time and don't have the same ability as perhaps somebody else does to be available and to be involved. And that's where Jimmy and I could have been really uh, crosswise if I tried to second guess what he was doing from a distance. Right, exactly. Another one you have, and, and you saw this firsthand living in, in England. I saw it here because my folks were in Ohio. I'm here in San Antonio, and there was a time difference. How does that affect that relationship? 
that even I find with my parents who now are in Arizona that even a couple of hours can make a, a it just sort of messes things up because you can't just necessarily pick up the phone and call somebody with what you're thinking or wanting to ask a question. You have to be mindful of that. And it just, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a huge difference, but it does make things a little bit more complicated. It's something else you have to consider. And if you do have relatives who, or you know, or kids who are living abroad, you know, those time differences can be five hours, 10 hours, 13 hours. And so you're really looking at very different times of the day. So finding, sometimes finding time that you can actually have a meaningful conversation can be a really tricky thing to do. I see that once in a while on Facebook. I have a, a teacher I used to work with here in San Antonio who now lives in London with her husband, uh, and she'll be posting in the middle of the night here. Right, exactly. Which is morning there. Right, right. And, and you went and through so, that. So if you were to call your folks, if it was 10 in the morning in London, it was the middle of the night in Arizona. Absolutely. And there are always those times where, you know, my parents would get confused or I would get confused and we'd be calling each other in the middle of the night. And, of course, any phone call in the middle of the night, right. you're sure something disastrous has happened. Yeah, exactly. One of the other balls you've got floating in the air here is differing cultural perspectives, which means... Mm -hmm which means that you might have, as I am, I am married to a Swedish person who um, is Hungarian Jewish by birth, and there are cultural differences in the way we approach family, the way we approach problem solving, and some of that is just personality difference, but some of it too is that we behave differently based on our cultural values, and a lot of times we're not even aware of how kind of imbued those things are into us. And so as I'm trying to problem solve with him about something with my parents or he's now trying to address something with his 93-year-old mother, we just have to be mindful that there are differences in kind of how we approach things and that some of those may be cultural. And I think with all of this, a lot of it is about awareness and being just sort of cognizant of the of the reality that you're in different situations, be it a time difference, being living far away, being that you're coming from a different culture. And I think the idea really is to be able to put that stuff on the table so that you can at least say, okay, yeah, these are factors that we just want to keep in mind and maybe sometimes we need to talk about. Uh, and, they and, get in the way. Uh, you know, and the talking about it, uh, is one of the challenges that families face. Uh, too often, as I know you know, Dr. Crystal, uh, folks don't really jump on a lot of these issues uh, until right. a crisis occurs. Exactly. exactly. Mama Which falls, breaks a hip, she's in the hospital, and can never go back home. What do we do now? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and this is why we are always encouraging people to begin these conversations as early as they can. And this is always really hard conversations to have, particularly with the older people in our lives, and they don't want to have those conversations any more than we do, um, because nobody likes thinking about somebody falling and not being able to come home again. And also old family dynamics come up. Sibling rivalry comes back into play. I remember a time when I flew in from London. My father was very ill for quite a long time. My siblings were there, and it was all as if we were you know, 15, 12, and 10 again, because all of that old stuff just surfaces right to the top when you're under stress. And I think it's important to remember, too, that in a crisis situation, you're under incredible stress. And so everybody needs to give everybody else a lot of leeway and latitude. And you want to think about what is our ultimate goal here. So I need to do the best I can to let go of, you know, what's deemed an insult or what, you know, a cutting remark or, you know, somebody's idea that I thought was stupid, got to try the best we can to let go of that stuff and really focus on what is it that we need to achieve here. All right, now stay with me just a minute. We're going to do a little business at our end. You will disappear into the Maxwell Smart cone of silence, but you'll still be here. So don't hang up. Stick with us. We're talking with Jill Crystal, a clinical psychologist, talking about 
distance caregiving and parenting and what those challenges are. I'm Ron Aaron. Carol Zerniel on special assignment today, and we're delighted to have Dr. Crystal with us. You're listening to Caregiver SOS on air on 930 AM, The Answer. One of the things I'd love to talk about with uh, Dr. Robin Eikoff, I'm Ron Aaron, by the way, is prevention, and it's something that WellMed spends a lot of time on. We do spend a lot of time on prevention because the fact is we know when we spend time on prevention, people live longer, healthier lives. So what do you look for in in, in terms of preventing disease? Well, as a provider, we're going to spend a lot of time with our patients looking at lab work, doing tests, looking for things early, encouraging preventative exams like an eye exam, uh, mammograms, colonoscopies, all the things that help us prevent severe illness. And it's one of the things that WellMed has always prided itself on. We've always been the forerunner for prevention, and now everybody's jumping on board, and I'm glad to see it. Giving new meaning to patient-centered health care. Yes, it does. Dr. Robin Eikoff, I'm Ron Aaron. By the way, you catch us on WellMed Radio Saturdays at 5 in the afternoon, right here on 930 AM, The Answer. Well, we are delighted to have you sticking with us here on Caregiver SOS On Air. I'm Ron Aaron. You hear us at 930 a.m. The Answer, and we have been talking with Dr. Jill Crystal, who is president of Traditional Learning Curves, a fascinating discussion about problems and transitions involving uh, not only caregiving, but when you're distant from uh, the care recipient or perhaps uh, someone else in your family is providing care and you're trying to provide your two cents from a long way off. Dr. Crystal has a great deal of knowledge and information on that, and it's been fun talking with her. And we have a great surprise, Dr. Crystal Peaches Hall, who is here in San Antonio with us, the director of the Doris Griffin One Stop Senior Center has popped into the studio. She's got a long history, both as a uh, fa- military family where she traveled the country and the world, but also working in memory units in Florida uh, with Alzheimer's patients and families. So we're going to welcome her into this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was thank excited you. Wonderful. to hear about um, the changing of your, of your mind thought on that. And that truly is when we would move so much, uh, even overseas, I had to stop thinking, oh, gosh, we had to move. And then I could feel myself every two years going, I hope we move because I don't want to paint. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I remember actually speaking to somebody who had said something very similar. She said, I never stayed anywhere long enough that I had to paint the house. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty good. I wish you could yes. fold into that, cut the lawn. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a, be a quicker turnaround, yeah. however. Yeah, exactly. That would be, you wouldn't even have really time to unpack your bag. Yeah. You know, one of the things, and let's take advantage of Peaches' background as well, uh, as we take a look at the demographics with uh, so many baby boomers uh, turning 65 uh, every day in this country, uh, and a projected a huge increase in Alzheimer's and related dementias. Uh, the need for caregiving is going to be outstripped by the number of people who need care. Uh, and many of this, because we're families who are spread all over the country, puts on special challenges. Uh, how can you be a long distance caregiver, Jill? Well, <laughs> In, you can't obviously physically be there, and so I think that the real role becomes being supportive of the people who are there. And I think it's really important to understand that that you know you're not physically present, and so you're not going to have all the information. And to be tolerant of and and grateful for the people who are on the ground. And so ways that you can support them either through, um, you know, just picking up the phone and letting them talk, um, trying to problem solve with them, perhaps either Skyping into doctor's appointments or kind of being on the phone in doctor's appointments so that, um, you know, the people on the ground don't necessarily have to go to every single appointment. Um, every now and then saying something that just says thank you for, you know, for, for, for being the one on the ground, you know, maybe, I don't know, sending flowers or, you know, some kind of gift certificate. Or and a, a, another piece 
is that when you do actually come into town, and I can't remember if we talked about this um, earlier, but but that very often the, the person who is absent, when they come into town, they're sort of seen as, you know, the savior, the great one, the good one for coming to visit. And I often hear stories about kind of the ones who are there all the time sort of being shunted aside and not being valued and not being appreciated. So I think to acknowledge kind of that, you know, you're coming in, but but really the special ones are the ones who are there all the time. Yeah, you had mentioned that, that suddenly they feel like chopped liver. Right, exactly. The other thing I saw, too, was that many times when they would call long distance and they'd talk to the caregiver, they were very critical of the choices they made, um, whether it was yeah. a medication choice or where they placed them for care or are you not checking, is the room not, you know, have a camera in it? Just, you know, and the, it just seemed like they felt that they were never doing the right thing or enough and very unappreciative. Yeah, and, and I think that so much family conflict mm. and old roles can get played out through these kinds of situations. Well, I'll tell you how my brother solved that. Uh, he was caregiver for uh, uh, my mom after my dad passed away, uh, mm -hmm. and he's in Cleveland, Ohio, where my mom was. I'm in San Antonio, Texas. We're talking one day, and I said, uh, I, I just asked what I thought was a simple question. You know, have you had a review of her medication? Mm -hmm. And he said to me, he, like you, Jill, by the way, is a Ph.D. psychologist, so he's, he's not uneducated. He, he, said, he said, Ronnie, I'll I, I tell you what, uh, she'll be on a plane tomorrow. Uh, I'll send her bags via Mayflower Moving, and she'll be in San Antonio, and uh, you got it, guy. Mm -hmm. I never mm -hmm. asked another question. <laughs> well, I think the question to ask is more kind of, what can I do to help? Right. How can I be of help? You know, I meant personal questions about, you know, how she's doing, what's she doing, yes. what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think also when you step into those minefields, also to sort of instead of, you know, kind of going at it with your brother, to recognize that as his stress and that he's the one on the ground and to back off and try and re-explain what you were asking, that you weren't meaning it as an attack that you really just kind of were trying to get some basic information. You know, the funny part about it, uh, in his, especially in his practice, one of the things he always said to me, he never, ever wanted to deal with seniors in his practice. And, of course, he ended up doing it in, uh, in providing caregiving for my mom. So I think God yes, keeps so. books. Peaches, you want to <laughs> jump in. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and don't they say never say never? Yeah. And I think, too, when you start your conversation, instead of saying, did you check on this for mom, how is it, maybe sometimes to say, how are you doing? Yes, really good point. Well, one of our uh, uh, counselors here uh, in, in San Antonio, Jo McQueen, uh, often says that when she looks at someone as a caregiver and says just what Peach has said, how are you doing, uh, the floodgates open, the tears come, and, and they tell you, uh, you know, I'm not really doing well. Yeah. 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 Now, and, as and you, I think, go ahead. Just to be prepared for that and to know that, you know, a lot of times there's not a whole lot that you can actually do to fix it or to change it. But I think just letting the person have an opportunity to vent can be invaluable. Mm -hmm. Now, in your other life, you work with executives and families who are uh, often moving. Uh, uh, as, as you think about uh, how you move them through that process, uh, take families and caregivers and care recipients who may have to move and, and relocate. Uh, th that brings special challenges. It, it, it's a really difficult situation, and, and we were just um, speaking about it this morning to a group that I work with, um, um, an international employee assistance program, and they were telling me that it hits single people particularly hard. Hmm. So single people who are being moved abroad, who very often, from what they were saying, don't have siblings um, or, you know, don't have large families. And so that position of being removed and very far away from 
their elderly relatives just creates tremendous amounts of guilt and, and you know, never feeling like you're doing enough or doing the right thing. So what do you tell them? So a lot of it is to normalize, to let them know that this is part of what happens. And so don't be surprised if and when it does. And that to, to try and find either somebody through their work through the um, employee assistance program or supports on the ground who can who can help you who will communicate with you um, you might try and set up a point person but it's a very tough situation one of the things the military does and it's been really comforting is when we get to a duty station especially overseas is they always had a sponsor there for us Mm-hmm. So that was yeah. another military family? Mm, yes. And so they would say, oh, when we first got here, oh, we thought we'd never get this furniture set up and get the car in. And here's, you know, the, the quick ways to do it and some shortcuts. And they would take us out to eat or, you know, invite us over. So we just felt like there was a connection. Mm-hmm. And, and Jill, as you think about uh, the long distance caregiver, the family right. that are so divided and so split, uh, not only does that bring special challenges, but uh, for the individual who maybe it's a son or a daughter who's living in another community, uh, you mentioned earlier using Skype or uh, FaceTime uh, as a great way to connect. And are, are people now taking advantage of that? I think that people really are. And I know that one of the challenges for Older people can be getting them set up with this technology and, and you know, getting them to be able to use it efficiently and effectively. So I think that sometimes that can cause a lot of frustration um, because you might, you know, train a parent, kind of teach a parent how to use this technology. And if they can, it can be incredibly helpful and effective. Um, Another tool is WhatsApp, um, which is a phone, kind of allows for free texting, free message sending, free picture sending, and free video sending. And it's basically like making a phone call. And so any of these kind of technologies that you can set your relatives Mm. up for is is going to be helpful and allow you to have those to just to be more connected. I, I missed the name of that phone system. What is it? It's called WhatsApp. So the word what? Right. And then A P P. And it is uh, low tech, but provides those high tech services. Exactly. Oh, that's pretty cool. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yes. There's another one called Viber, which is similar, but WhatsApp seems to be just a little bit more um, advanced. And for the uh, senior who hasn't used that technology, Peaches at the uh, Doris Griffin Senior One-Stop Center, you have computers, you have computer classes. Mm -hmm. What's been the response of those who come in with no knowledge of technology? At first, they do not want to, and so we started our first class, and it was called, I do not want to know about the computer, but my grandkids are driving (laughs) me crazy. So, and it filled up. It filled up. It was just that they were afraid. And every grandkid in America texts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's a great way to reach grandma and for her to reach you. Yeah, we have a, a class on how to use your cell phone, too. Well, we got to say goodbye to you, Jill Crystal, flat out of time. Is there a website folks can go to find out more about you? Yes, uh, www.transitionallearning.com. www.transitionallearning.com. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Okay, you take care. Psychologist... Dr. Jill Crystal. I'm Ron Aaron. Peaches Hall filling in for Carol Zerniel here on Caregiver SOS on air on 9.30 a.m. The Answer. Up next, you got it. Take 10. I'm Ron Aaron, and one of the things I'm most pleased about being a well-med patient is the way in which I'm treated by all the staff at the clinic I go to. And Dr. Robin Eikhoff 
Uh, that's not by accident. No, it's not. We really spend a lot of time training our staff and asking them to really connect with the patients and get to know them because we consider them part of our clinic home. And the other thing that's really impressive to me is the amount of time my well-med physician spends with me, and you do the same thing with your patients. Yeah, I, I really do try to, and, and we do a lot, a lot more time than your typical uh, provider can afford to give, and I think that allows us to get to know the whole patient and not just their diseases. That's cool. Don't have a lot of time to talk about prevention, but you do a lot of that as well. We spend an enormous amount of time on preventative measures. Want information about WellMed? Want to be a WellMed patient? Call 210-614-WELL. 210-614-WELL. Oh, I love that little percussion sound. That's nice. You're listening to Take 10 on Caregiver SOS On Air. I'm Ron Aaron. Along with our co-host, Carol Zernio, we are joined each week by Dr. Jamie Heisman, nationally known therapist, deals with issues involving caregivers and addictions. And so we thought we'd play right into one of his strengths today as we talk about what are addictions all about, why are people unfortunately willing or not willing to destroy their lives because of an addiction and among seniors, Carol, we see this all the time, well, I know, drugs and alcohol. I know Jamie has educated us about the growing problem of addictions, and unfortunately, uh, the attitude many times is these are older people, let them do what they want, we're not going to intervene, it's okay if they drink themselves to death, it's okay if they take drugs, they're old, what else would they be doing is kind of the attitude. Let grandpa have fun. Yeah, let him have his fun if that's what he wants to do. So, you know, is that the attitude we should be having, Jamie? Well, Carol, you know, you work with WellMed, so we're living longer and longer. So maybe that was the attitude 100 years ago when we were living to possibly 50 and 60 years old. But the last time I looked, life really is beginning for many people at 60. Um, if you look at AARP, their largest entrepreneurial sector right now, they're starting businesses, are boomers and seniors. So let me return the favor to you and ask you, you know, at that age, is life really over? Well, I would, I would have to beg to say, no, I don't think it is. But why is it that we are seeing such an increase um, in drug addictions, in alcohol addiction, among older people, because that's not the group that most people think about. Well, I think alcohol addiction has always been there. I think, you know, in terms of reporting it, it's always been very difficult because family caregivers are the ones who usually report it. In fact, family caregivers, if you really think about it, are probably genetically predisposed as well to the same alcoholism that their mom, father, or, or whoever the family member actually is because it's a genetically predisposed condition. So I think we're becoming more and more aware that this issue is out there, and we're actually educating, if you will, family caregivers that there's help and treatment there. But to the point of why now, I think we're really looking at substance abuse and senior citizens in a different way because there's such a huge geometric trend to addictions around opiates, benzodiazepines, um, Basically, so, pain remedies. So I should say, yeah. So a benzodiazepine, a what? Why, what would I, that look like? What would I know it, the name by? Well, it's an anti-anxiety, a benzodiazepine. I've seen seniors on it for, you know, 30, 40 years. In, in the olden days, when Ron and I were around, of course, they called it Milltown. We hear it now called, you know, Xanax or Valium. Those have been prescribed for years upon years by doctors, usually primary care doctors that just wanted people to calm down, but they forgot that that's an addictive substance. As to pain, obviously, when we're seeing so many patients, not in our environment, but in fee-for-service environment, you can bet that doctors really who see 30 or 40 patients can't spend more than a certain amount of time talking somebody out of the prescription so they usually give in and give the prescription for pain medication. There was a piece in the New York Times recently about prescribing drugs to seniors that really are not recommended, Valium being one. Uh, and the best time of day to ask your doctor for that prescription is late in the day. They, they're too tired to fight with you. Thank you for empowering us, Ron. <laughs> 
You know, it makes so much sense, though, if you really think about it. I have an old saying, which everybody, I'm sure, will bear it out. It takes five minutes to tell somebody yes, and it takes 40 minutes to tell somebody no. Exactly. So if you have 30 patients and a bunch waiting in the waiting room, what are you going to say? And unfortunately, you see doctors who aren't really monitored in a fee-for-service environment taking the path of least resistance. So what what's the answer? Um, if I'm that older person and I've been taking, you know, Valium for years, anti-anxiety or painkillers, what should I be doing instead? Let's say it's painkillers. I am in pain. I have horrible arthritis. What, what's the answer if I can't take my painkillers? Well, actually, you can. I, I, pain is legitimate. And the last thing I want to be is a zealot on top of a mountain telling people that they can't treat their pain. Pain is certainly legitimate, and there's legitimate you know, pain medication for that. What happens often is that a primary care doctor or any doctor, a neurologist, a specialist who prescribes pain remedies doesn't even know the behavioral health history of the person in front of them. You know, psychiatry usually with that world. And and you're not seeing many people refer, many physicians, if you will, refer out to a psychiatrist. So if you don't know the behavioral health history and you're using you know, an addictive substance, chances are the person is going to become addicted. So there are several things you need to do. You need to hopefully get the caregivers involved and educate them as to what to watch in their loved one and to make sure they're watching them. And if they do, make sure they're part of the treatment team and can come back and, and, and discuss it. Also, you want to make sure you give um, patients immediate visits back. I mean, I've often seen patients who took opiates for a length of time not necessarily come back and find out they're addicted and then not come back to their doctor because they don't believe their doctor will write them prescriptions. So there are a whole group of things you can do. But support and connecting a senior is the most important thing. But so, dealing with the pain, I'm sorry, the pain is, as Carol said, a, a very real issue and I know there are many who specialize in pain medicine who will tell you their concern very often is that doctors underprescribe. And that may well be true also as a reaction, Ron. I'm not saying that many now, you know, in America, we tend to overreact to certain things and we, we then come back and the, the pendulum gets to the, if we hope, into the middle. Um, but we're seeing that. But I would think that in tandem with the proper pain medication that a good pain specialist, remember what I'm saying, pain specialist, because they are truly trained in that. I said, in addition to that, I think there are complementary medicine interventions. You know, there's, there's meditation, there's mindfulness, there's a lot of biofeedback, uh, there's support groups. There's so many things, I think, that can be added uh, in tandem with the pain medication. Yeah, I re- good I- oversight, good case management, uh, and good you know, uh, quality utilization really helps in this process. So I can remember a friend of mine whose father um, had terrible diabetes and it had gotten spiraled out of control and, and he had gone to big, strong, walking, hiking guy to in a wheelchair in tremendous amount of pain, lots of pain. Um, and he was just fighting, you know, the pain pills and being in the wheelchair and being depressed, all these bad things. And he did um, meet someone, a, a physician, who recommended some pain management, and it really was exercises in controlling the pain through visualization, visualizing the pain, getting smaller, 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 we, we, breathing through it like you would in Lama's class. Um, and all of those techniques actually worked. He was able not only to get off the pain medication, he was able to reduce his pain enough that he could did exercise and strengthen himself, got back out of the wheelchair, and he was back Mr. Hiking Man again after a period of time. But it took that intervention um, of someone teaching him how to manage that pain and get through that really tough time. You know, Carol, there's a whole show we could dedicate to this, and probably we don't have time, but what you just articulated was a Buddhist philosophy. They call it the two arrows. The first arrow is pain, the real pain, the pain that we feel, shoulders, emotional, um, back, you know, whatever it is that we're feeling. The second arrow, according to the Buddhist, is the pain of suffering. It's the story we tell ourselves about the pain, creating this whole world around this pain, you know, if you moved into the pain, like Carl Jung would say, embrace the shadow, 
and were able to really deal with it one-on-one, if you will, mano a mano, you'd find an entirely different sort of process. And let's not forget the health consequences associated with all this medication is, is huge. It's balance, it's cognitive issues, it's depression. So to your point and to the Buddhist point, avoid the second arrow. So if what would I look for? How would I know that the person I'm caring for has an addiction? Well, you know, you can watch them. Obviously, if, it's a, if you are a family caregiver or a caregiver at all and you know the pattern of behavior they were before, it's basically not as difficult to see that they're in steady decline. But certainly you can see um, behavior that's hiding medication, if you will. It, you know, the, one of the big issues is doctor shopping. So if you start seeing a loved one, really, instead of going back to their own primary care or their own neurologist or whoever's treating the pain, but want to seek out another physician or an ER or another doorway, your, your, your alarms should go off at that particular point in time. If you do see balance and gait issues, if you're noticing different cognitive issues happening, uh, if you're starting to see sleep problems or depression um, or any adverse reaction, I think you really you know, ha- should have a, a red flag go up in your mind. And what do you do? In 20 That's seconds. an interesting thing, you know, because it's a long, involved process of what we call intervention. But I think you first accept it. You know, you don't panic. You understand treatment for addictions are, are out there, and, they, and they, they tend to really work. But I also would get the entire family involved. Got to stop you right there. You're right. We'll do, another, sure. we'll do another take 10 on this because we are flat out of time. Dr. Jamie Heisman, Carol Zerniel. I'm Ron Aaron. We thank you for listening to us on Take 10. We will talk with you soon on 930 AM, The Answer. You've been listening to Caregiver SOS on air, presented by the WellMed Charitable Foundation. Email suggestions and comments on this radio program at wellmed.net. And join your hosts, Ron Aaron and Carol Zerniel, for another edition of Caregiver SOS on air on 930 AM, The Answer.